Good morning and welcome to Africa Amplified, Bloomberg's monthly show bringing Africa's story to the world. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in Johannesburg. Today we take a deep dive into Nigeria. While the country often vies for top position as the continent's biggest economy, a plunging Naira and dwindling foreign reserves have helped compound issues in the country, leading to a drop in foreign direct investment and an exodus of multinationals. The new president and central bank governor continue to take steps to reinstill confidence in their policies, including a bumper rate hike and the removal of subsidies. And many investors are actually seeing a positive way forward. We're going to hear from some of those investors this morning, including retail king Christo Visa. But first, let's dive into the stories and issues affecting markets with our reporters from across the continent. We're going to take you to Lagos in the west and Kigali in the east. But for now, we start in the east and the south with our reporters in Kigali and Johannesburg, uh, beginning here with Bloomberg's Ntando Tequana joining me in studio. So Ntando, the big story is really that we now have an election here in South Africa. And the even bigger story is that potentially the ANC, which has ruled uh, this country or been a majority in this country, could potentially lose their majority for the first time since democracy in 1994. Can you just talk about this and outline the situation for us right now? The situation, Jen, is that um, the ANC is likely to form, to end up in a situation where it is forced to form a coalition government. Um, if you have to look at the past results, uh, past voter turnout, you will realize that over the, 20, the past 20 years, the ANC has um, fallen from a support base of 70% of, of to um, about 57% in the last election. Uh, also, if, if you look at the results in the uh, provincial governments, in, in the pre provincial elections, they have also been losing support, great support, especially in uh, significant regions like the KZN and Gauteng. Um, so in polls currently suggest that NC uh, at best will probably get um, 50, um, 47 percent uh, in, in, in this election and they will have to tap smaller parties to help them at least retain power. A, a, a party that will help them, you know, get about 4%, would th then they'll be able to form a, a coalition government. Well, so considering that, I mean, who are the big names, the big kingmakers of the party? Of course, we know Cyril Ramaphosa in the ANC, but who else should we be watching out for? So there are uh, a number of possibilities, but all those possibilities are actually it's going to be a desperate um, solution. Um, if you look at the main rival, the Democratic Alliance, uh, they've, they've vowed not to ever work with the ANC. Um, but in terms of the markets, they would be more comfortable with the DA partnering with uh, the ANC because they view them as a party that will be able to hold the ANC accountable. Um, and then there's uh, someone like an IFP or Inkata Freedom Party, uh, which is more a safer option, um, has more of a shape and form similar to the ANC, but they've also said that they, they don't want to work with um, the, the ANC uh, government. But there is clear logic on why they could work, um, wh why those two parties can work together. Uh, and then there's the left-leaning um, the, the, the left leaning economic free freedom fighters, uh, which uh, um, the markets don't really prefer that, that setup. And they've also said that they won't be working with the ANC. Uh, but all... all Especially because um, the EFF would want a, a more of a power-sharing deal, but the detail will be in the negotiate in, in all of the negotiations in terms of what positions they can negotiate for. So then, what is it that the markets then are paying attention to next? I mean, we have this May 29th date, but is it just going to be a lot of political wrangling over the next few weeks and months? We expect there to be a lot of um, tussles between uh, the parties. But uh, what's important now is that the ANC does look to, um, you know, be in trouble. And who will be the next, the next part, who will be the next sensible party to partner with them? And it's really important to stress this is a very consequential election, and we know you'll be uh, following it for us. Uh, thanks so much to Bloomberg's Ntando Tequana joining me here in Johannesburg. Uh, and sticking with elections, there's another political race we're going to be keeping our eyes on in the coming period, and it's happening in Senegal, where opposition leaders have rejected a proposal for postponed elections to be held on June 2nd. It means President Macky Sall's term could be extended until a successor is appointed. Sall has insisted he'll step down on April 
April 2nd when his mandate ends. Protests, a government crackdown on opposition, and a sell-off of the nation's dollar bonds have destabilized at Senegal after the original February elections were postponed. Now, let's turn it back to our top stories here. Uh, Kenya has been added to the Financial Action Task Force dirty money list due to shortcomings in tackling illicit financial flows. Namibia was also included, but Uganda has now come off the list. For more on this, let's bring in our Andira Oganga, who is joining us from Kigali. So, Andira, thanks so much for being here, as always. Talk to us about how significant this is for Kenya to now be on this list. Jen, Kenya could be staring at stricter due diligence protocols moving forward while dealing with the rest of the world. And this could be a blow because President William Ruto is traveling the world trying to lure in investors. And this gray listing could mean that it will increase government's foreign funding costs and also weigh on trade flows. The National Treasury says they've amended the necessary laws to deal with dirty money and what's left is implementation. They also say they have the support of the World Bank and the IMF for strengthening the institutions that that will help in this fight. However, due to the gray listing, Kenya now joins Tanzania and South Sudan in East Africa, the rest of Africa, Nigeria, South Africa, Senegal, Cameroon, but such a relief for Uganda to be taken off that list. Yeah, and we've been following this story very closely in terms of the countries coming on and off the list. Uh, Andira, you just mentioned Tanzania uh, and this interesting story about a multi-million dollar deal uh, with the country and also Chinese firms has been something you've been following. Can you just walk us through the details here? Mm -hmm. So the contract was awarded to China Railway Major Bridge Engineering Group and also the Wuhan Engineering Coin. They're supposed to contract, construct rather diesel, petrol and jet fuel tanks with a capacity of 420,000 metric tons. And this project will take about two years to complete and they're hoping to build a strategic petroleum reserve and also cut down vessel turnaround time from 12 days to three days as Tanzania tries to establish itself as the regional fuel hub. This project also comes at a very strategic time because Uganda is considering shifting its imports landing from the port of Mabasa in Kenya to the port of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Yeah, and when we talk about investment in terms of China, it's really important to point out uh, something like this. Uh, thanks so much to Andira Oganga, who is in Kigali for us, and also Ntando Tukwana here in Johannesburg for our updates this morning. All right, coming up, we're going to take a look at why multinationals have been exiting Nigeria and the role of the economic downturn in their decisions. But the CEO of the Africa Finance Corporation believes it's not all doom and gloom for investments in the country. Take a listen. The macro situation is cyclical, so we believe that this is not something that will last you know, uh, forever. We think that with the right um, measures, especially those that have been announced, you know, uh, we can see some change over the next two to three years, especially if we focus on export earnings, we focus on revenue flows, we focus on agricultural output, uh, all of which will help manage inflation. Uh, we would see improvement in the economy. Sticking with our top story, Nigeria's currency crisis has triggered an exodus of businesses from the country. At least four multinationals have announced their ending production as a scarcity of dollars, a naira in free fall, and rampant inflation slashes profits. I took a look at the outlook for the country. Take a listen. It's one of Africa's biggest economies, but multinationals are finding it increasingly difficult to do business in Nigeria and some are even starting to leave. Last December, U.S. consumer goods giant Procter & Gamble announced its exit from Nigeria only seven years after opening a $300 million factory in the country. In recent months, GSK, Bayer, and Sanofi have also said they're on their way out, while Unilever has cut some of the products it was manufacturing in the country. 
In 2022, FDI inflows turned negative. $187 million worth of foreign investment left the country. So why the exodus? The main reason is the difficulty the firms face in getting their money back home due to the lack of dollars in Nigeria's economy. The Naira slump over the past year, along with rising prices, are also slashing the profits of conglomerates. And that's not all. Unreliable electricity supply, complex bureaucracy, and congestion at ports are adding to the challenge of doing business in Nigeria. And while global companies make their exit, economic concerns and price pressures have pushed many Nigerians to protest. Since taking power a year ago, President Bola Tinubu has introduced policies he believes are necessary to revive the economy, including simplifying taxes and duties and cutting red tape for foreign companies. Whether that's enough to keep big multinationals in Nigeria and attract new investment, though, remains to be seen. Now, Africa's biggest grocer, ShopRite, left Nigeria in 2021, 16 years after opening its first store in the country. I spoke with the former ShopRite chairman, Christovisa, South Africa's billionaire retail king, explained the challenges of doing business in Nigeria. But he also told me foreign investors will return. Nigeria, like many African countries, had developed as single commodity economies. You know, Nigeria, in Nigeria, this case, oil. So the economy appears to do very well when the oil price is high, but the converse also applies. If the oil price slips, the economy goes into a nosedive and consumer spending takes a heck of a hit. But that applies to many African countries. Uh, and then that obviously leads, again, wrong policies, and you have a constant devaluation of the local currencies. And that makes it very, very difficult for a foreign investor to get a return on his investment. We were very bullish about Nigeria uh, when we went in there, and initially it went very well, and then the calamities started. Uh, low oil price, low consumer confidence, low consumer spending, coupled, and that's really the killer, the constant regular devaluation of the currency, which we see virtually so this... every month. <laughs> right. So then is the solution to, to exit, you know, one of Africa's biggest economies, or you know, if we take a look at the, envi the economic environment right now, uh, how, do you, how do you navigate it? What do you do? Do you wait for the policies to come in place? What would you say? Yeah, I, I think one would, you know, most foreign investors, including South African investors, I think when it comes to Nigeria, have adopted an attitude that it's too early. We've got to wait for things to settle, uh, for the economy to to develop more, and then for governments that adopt the correct policies. Uh, now, when that's going to happen is an open question, but that it will happen uh, is not in doubt. Christo Visa also weighed in on the upcoming elections in South Africa. He believes the vote could be a turning point for the country. I think there's general acceptance even in government circles, that we have to up our game considerably. Do you see that happening in, in 2024, Dr. Visa? Or, you know, especially considering this is an election year, I mean, are, are, you, are you thinking yeah. there might be a ways out from actually seeing that materialize? I think so. You know, uh, I'm an a incurable optimist, so just take everything I say <laughs> with that caveat. But, uh, yeah, I think sometimes, you know, countries and economies like businesses have to hit really rough patches because before people change their uh, minds uh, as to the way they're doing things. And I think South Africa is getting to that stage 
Uh, we are seeing slowly uh, greater private sector involvement in what is normally regarded as state responsibilities. So yeah, I'm very optimistic that, uh, that we'll get there. Uh, is there an outcome, though, come May 29th that you think will will get the country there faster? Well, I think, yes, I, I think all the indications are that we are going to enter an era of coalition governments. Now, you know, governments like that present their own problems and challenges, but right. uh, coalition governments will at the very least mean a change of direction. And obviously, we're all hoping a change for the good. South African billionaire investor Christo Visa speaking with me earlier. All right, coming up, markets are hoping that drastic policy measures in Abuja will help stabilize currency reserves and the Naira. We're in Lagos next. This is Bloomberg. have a new government that is trying to stabilize the economy and they are looking at um, several good levers for that to happen. I think the number one challenge now is stabilizing the macro environment and trying to look at several initiatives that will improve revenue flow um, in the country, uh, improve dollar access, improve supply of um, export earnings uh, to stabilize the Naira. Uh, and I'm sure that they have addressed, uh, they have announced a couple of initiatives um, towards that. And if we give them time, we'll see that transmit to the larger economy. All right, Africa Finance Corporation CEO Samaila Zubairu there giving us his take on how Nigeria is taking steps to emerge from a crippling currency crisis. Now, for more, I am joined by Yvonne Mango from Bloomberg Economics here in studio with me in Johannesburg. But first, let's bring in our Lagos Bureau Chief, Anthony Osei Brown, who has been very busy, to say the least, over the past few weeks. Anthony, okay, so we saw a historic rate hike at the end of the February or at the February MPC meeting. I mean, are the markets responding yet? What is their interpretation of this? Yeah, the markets, uh, it's been a missed response. We've seen a significant appreciation in the currency, in the official market, and also in the parallel market. And good, uh, both uh, markets have, the gap between both markets is closed. And so uh, that's positive. That's something the central bank will want to sustain. On the other hand, we've seen bond prices uh, fall, and that means yields are going up. And that could indicate that uh, foreign uh, portfolio investors want to see more action. So, yeah, so far the uh, response has been a bit uh, missed. And this, we're waiting for the central bank to take more action to see uh, stability in the currency markets, basically. All right. Let's bring in uh, Yvonne Mango, Anthony. Uh, she, as I mentioned, is from Bloomberg Economics. Yvonne, you've also been following this very closely. I mean, talk to us about your assessment of, of these most recent policy measures, and especially because we haven't heard from Cardozo very much until this point. Correct. This was his first MPC meeting since he was appointed in September. So we must say we're very encouraged by the result of the MPC meeting earlier this week when they raised the policy rate by 400 basis points. Uh, they need to act aggressively in order to restore positive rates. Um, and this had to come alongside other policies that we've seen already take place, which is the devaluations that have led to the convergence of the official and parallel exchange rate, um, and also the uh, paying down of the uh, foreign exchange backlog that we've seen. Is, is this the aggressively that, that you think is enough to really stabilize uh, the, the economy here, or is the, the government going to need to do even more? 
aside from what we're seeing on the monetary policy side, so on the monetary policy side, we still need to see more rate hikes mm. because uh, there's a big margin between where inflation's at, at 30%, and where the policy rate's at 22%. But in addition, as you've rightly put, fiscal policy also needs to support what the central bank is doing. We need to see structural reforms that help bring the cost of doing business down. Uh, one of the reasons food is a big uh, driver of inflation is because of structural issues, including insecurity. So yes, we need to see some more work on the fiscal policy side to complement what's happening at the central bank. Well, and we've also seen, you know, a lot of protests because, you know, the government is having to do this balancing act, right, of stabilizing the economy, yeah. but also not sending, you know, an economy that is 40 percent in poverty already even further down. Yes, and that's often the challenge of reform is that someone t uh, takes pain from it. And indeed, uh, as we've mentioned, inflation is already uh, particularly high, which is eroding real income. Um, interest rates are rising, um, as we've mentioned. Uh, following this rate hike, we expect more, which makes it uh, harder to access credit. So it is a tough environment, but it's the pain the country needs in the short term in order to bear the fruits over the medium to long term. And you, you mentioned accessing credit, and I know that uh, you and the team have been looking at a number of African countries that have been returning to the eurobond markets nigeria potentially being one down down the road uh, why is that i mean what is this moment how are you assessing this moment right now okay so essentially what we've seen over the past two years is african countries shut out of the eurobond market and that was due to soaring us uh, rates which made it uh, which really elevated borrowing costs what's exciting is we've seen a return of african countries uh, to the eurobond market we've had cote d'ivoire benin and kenya issue eurobonds earlier this year and we're expecting more to come. Nigeria, we expect to issue probably as soon as um, the end of this year. Part of the reason is to refinance. Uh, so similar to Kenya, they have a bond due next year. Um, Kenya is due this year, but um, um, Ken uh, Nigeria has a bond of 1.2 billion that's due next year. We also expect Angola to come to market. They also have a euro bond due. Um, G Gabon potentially um, also seeking to refinance. So there are quite a few countries that we see in the pipeline coming to market. Is there a similar thread throughout all of these countries? I mean, are they all relatively stabi stabilized from a macroeconomic perspective or, or what is it? That's a good uh, a question. So what we're generally seeing is that um, the countries that are coming first to market are those that need to refinance mm -hmm. uh, bonds. So they've got bonds that are coming due and they need to raise dollar funding in order to repay those bonds. So most of the countries coming to market fall in that bucket. However, there are a minority of countries that have got strong fundamentals that feel that they need to diversify their funding for their bad budget deficits or just to show up their foreign exchange liquidity. And Cote d'Ivoire and Benin probably fall into that category. Does the direction of what we're seeing in the U.S. potentially uh, have any impact on it? Really quick, we have like 20 seconds. Yes, no, absolutely. Uh, the fact that we're seeing, we we'll like to see uh, U.S. rates fall implies that borrowing costs do decline for African countries. All right. Really appreciate uh, your time and your reporting uh, as your analysis, Yvonne. Uh, that is a Von Mango from Bloomberg Economics and our Lagos Bureau Chief Anthony Ose Brown is standing by for us. All right, that is all we have time for today. Join us again next month. From me, Jennifer Zabasaja in Johannesburg, it's goodbye for now, but we'll see you next time.